the picture of dorian gray by oscar wilde chapter sixteen a cold rain began to fall and the blurred street lamps looked ghastly in the dripping mist the public houses were just closing and dim men and women were clustering in broken groups round their doors from some of the bars came the sound of horrible laughter in others drunkards brawled and screamed lying back in the hansom with his hat pulled over his forehead dorian gray watched with listless eyes the sordid shame of the great city and now and then he repeated to himself the words that lord henry had said to him on the first day they had met to cure the soul by means of the senses and the senses by means of the soul yes that was the secret he had often tried it and would try it again now there were opium dens where one could buy oblivion dens of horror where the memory of old sins could be destroyed by the madness of sins that were new the moon hung low in the sky like a yellow skull from time to time a huge misshapen cloud stretched a long arm across and hid it the gas lamps grew fewer and the streets more narrow and gloomy once the man lost his way and had to drive back half a mile a steam rose from the horse as it splashed up the puddles the side windows of the hansom were clogged with a grey flannel mist to cure the soul by means of the senses and the senses by means of the soul how the words rang in his ears his soul certainly was sick to death was it true that the senses could cure it innocent blood had been spilled what could atone for that ah oh for that there was no atonement but though forgiveness was impossible forgetfulness was possible still and he was determined to forget to stamp the thing out to crush it as one would crush the adder that had stung one indeed what right had basil to have spoken to him as he had done who had made him a judge over others he had said things that were dreadful horrible not to be endured on and on plodded the hansom going slower it seemed to him at each step he thrust up the trap and called to the man to drive faster the hideous hunger for opium began to gnaw at him his throat burned and his delicate hands twitched nervously together he struck at the horse madly with his stick the driver laughed and whipped up he laughed in answer and the man was silent the way seemed interminable and the streets like the black web of some sprawling spider the monotony became unbearable and as the mist thickened he felt afraid then they passed by lonely brickfields the fog was lighter here and he could see the strange bottle-shaped kilns with their orange fan-like tongues of fire a dog barked as they went by and far away in the darkness some wandering seagulls screamed the horse stumbled in a rut then swerved aside and broke into a gallop after some time they left the clay road and rattled again over rough paven streets most of the windows were dark but now and then fantastic shadows were silhouetted against some lamplit blind he watched them curiously they moved like monstrous marionettes and made gestures like live things he hated them a dull rage was in his heart as they turned a corner a woman yelled something at them from an open door and two men ran after the hansom for about a hundred yards 
the driver beat at them with his whip it is said that passion makes one think in a circle certainly with hideous iteration the bitten lips of dorian gray shaped and reshaped those subtle words that dealt with soul and sense till he had found in them the full expression as it were of his mood and justified by intellectual approval passions that without such justification would still have dominated his temper from cell to cell of his brain crept the one thought and the wild desire to live most terrible of all man's appetites quickened into force each trembling nerve and fibre ugliness that had once been hateful to him because it made things real became dear to him now for that very reason ugliness was the one reality the coarse brawl the loathsome den the crude violence of disordered life the very vileness of thief and outcast were more vivid in their intense actuality of impression than all the gracious shapes of art the dreamy shadows of song they were what he needed for forgetfulness in three days he would be free suddenly the man drew up with a jerk at the top of a dark lane over the low roofs and the jagged chimney-stacks of the houses rose the black masts of ships wreaths of white mist clung like ghostly sails to the yards somewhere about here sir ain't it he asked huskily through the trap dorian started and peered round this will do he answered and having got out hastily and given the driver the extra fare he had promised him he walked quickly in the direction of the quay here and there a lantern gleamed at the stern of some huge merchantman the light shook and splintered in the puddles a red glare came from an outward bound steamer that was coaling the slimy pavement looked like a wet mackintosh he hurried on towards the left glancing back now and then to see if he was being followed in about seven or eight minutes he reached a small shabby house that was wedged in between two gaunt factories in one of the top windows stood a lamp he stopped and gave a peculiar knock after a little time he heard steps in the passage and the chain being unhooked the door opened quietly and he went in without saying a word to the squat misshapen figure that flattened itself into the shadow as he passed at the end of the hall hung a tattered green curtain that swayed and shook in the gusty wind which had followed him in from the street he dragged it aside and entered a long low room which looked as if it had once been a third-rate dancing saloon shrill flaring gas-jets dulled and distorted in the fly-blown mirrors that faced them were ranged round the walls greasy reflectors of ribbed tin backed them making quivering discs of light the floor was covered with ochre-coloured sawdust trampled here and there into mud and stained with dark rings of spilled liquor some malays were crouching by a little charcoal stove playing with bone counters and showing their white teeth as they chattered in one corner with his head buried in his arms a sailor sprawled over a table and by the tawdrily painted bar that ran across one complete side stood two haggard women mocking an old man who was brushing the sleeves of his coat with an expression of disgust he thinks he's got red ants on him laughed one of them as dorian passed by the man looked at her in terror and began to whimper at the end of the room there was a little staircase leading to a darkened chamber as dorian hurried up its three rickety steps the heavy odour of opium met him 
he heaved a deep breath and his nostrils quivered with pleasure when he entered a young man with smooth yellow hair who was bending over a lamp lighting a long thin pipe looked up at him and nodded in a hesitating manner you hear adrian muttered dorian where else should i be he answered listlessly none of the chaps will speak to me now i thought you had left england darlington's not going to do anything my brother paid the bill at last george doesn't speak to me either i don't care he added with a sigh as long as one has this stuff one doesn't want friends i think i have had too many friends dorian winced and looked round at the grotesque things that lay in such fantastic postures on the ragged mattresses the twisted limbs the gaping mouths the staring lustreless eyes fascinated him he knew in what strange heavens they were suffering and what dull hells were teaching them the secret of some new joy they were better off than he was he was prisoned in thought memory like a horrible malady was eating his soul away from time to time he seemed to see the eyes of basil hallward looking at him yet he felt he could not stay the presence of adrian singleton troubled him he wanted to be where no one would know who he was he wanted to escape from himself i'm going to the other place he said after a pause on the wharf yes that mad cat is sure to be there they won't have her in this place now dorian shrugged his shoulders i am sick of women who love one women who hate one are much more interesting besides the stuff is better much the same i like it better come and have something to drink i must have something i don't want anything murmured the young man never mind adrian singleton rose up wearily and followed dorian to the bar a half-caste in a ragged turban and a shabby ulster grinned a hideous greeting as he thrust a bottle of brandy and two tumblers in front of them the women sidled up and began to chatter dorian turned his back on them and said something in a low voice to adrian singleton a crooked smile like a malay crease writhed across the face of one of the women we are very proud to-night she sneered for god's sake don't talk to me cried dorian stamping his foot on the ground what do you want money here it is don't ever talk to me again two red sparks flashed for a moment in the woman's sodden eyes then flickered out and left them dull and glazed she tossed her head and raked the coins off the counter with greedy fingers her companion watched her enviously it's no use sighed adrian singleton i don't care to go back what does it matter i'm quite happy here you'll write to me if you want anything won't you said dorian after a pause perhaps good night then good night answered the young man passing up the steps and wiping his parched mouth with a handkerchief dorian walked to the door with a look of pain in his face as he drew the curtain aside a hideous laugh broke from the painted lips of the woman who had taken his money <laughs> there goes the devil's bargain she hiccoughed in a hoarse voice curse you he answered don't call me that she snapped her fingers prince charming is what you like to be called ain't it she yelled after him the drowsy sailor leaped to his feet as she spoke and looked wildly round the sound of the shutting of the hall door fell on his ear he rushed out as if in pursuit dorian gray hurried along the quay through the drizzling rain his meeting with adrian singleton had strangely moved him and he wondered if the ruin of that young life was really to be laid at his door as basil hallward had said to him with such infamy of insult he bit his lip 
and for a few seconds his eyes grew sad yet after all what did it matter to him one's days were too brief to take the burden of another's errors on one's shoulders each man lived his own life and paid his own price for living it the only pity was one had to pay so often for a single fault one had to pay over and over again indeed in her dealings with man destiny never closed her accounts there are moments psychologists tell us when the passion for sin or for what the world calls sin so dominates a nature that every fibre of the body as every cell of the brain seems to be instinct with fearful impulses men and women at such moments lose the freedom of their will they move to their terrible end as automatons move choice is taken from them and conscience is either killed or if it lives at all lives but to give rebellion its fascination and disobedience its charm for all sins as theologians weary not of reminding us are sins of disobedience when that high spirit that morning star of evil fell from heaven it was as a rebel that he fell callous concentrated on evil with stained mind and soul hungry for rebellion dorian gray hastened on quickening his step as he went but as he darted aside into a dim archway that had served him often as a shortcut to the ill-famed place where he was going he felt himself suddenly seized from behind and before he had time to defend himself he was thrust back against the wall with a brutal hand round his throat he struggled madly for life and by a terrible effort wrenched the tightening fingers away in a second he heard the click of a revolver and saw the gleam of a polished barrel pointing straight at his head and the dusky form of a short thick-set man facing him what do you want he gasped keep quiet said the man if you stir i shoot you you're mad what have i done to you you wrecked the life of sybil bain was the answer and sybil bain was my sister she killed herself i know it her death is at your door i swore i would kill you in return for years i have sought you i had no clue no trace the two people who could have described you were dead i knew nothing of you but the pet name she used to call you i heard it tonight by chance make your peace with god for tonight you are going to die dorian gray grew sick with fear i never knew her he stammered i have never heard of her you are mad you had better confess your sin for as sure as i am james vane you are going to die there was a horrible moment dorian did not know what to say or do down on your knees growled the man i give you one minute to make your peace no more i go on board tonight for india and i must do my job first one minute that's all dorian's arms fell to his side paralyzed with terror he did not know what to do suddenly a wild hope flashed across his brain stop he cried how long ago is it since your sister died quick tell me eighteen years said the man why do you ask what do years matter eighteen years laughed dorian gray with a touch of triumph in his voice eighteen years set me under the lamp and look at my face james vane hesitated for a moment not understanding what was meant then he seized dorian gray and dragged him from the archway dim and wavering as was the wind-blown light yet it served to show him the hideous error as it seemed into which he had fallen for the face of the man he had sought to kill had all the bloom of boyhood all the unstained purity of youth he seemed little more than a lad of twenty summers 
hardly older if older indeed at all than his sister had been when they had parted so many years ago it was obvious that this was not the man who had destroyed her life he loosened his hold and reeled back my god my god he cried and i would have murdered you dorian gray drew a long breath you have been on the brink of committing a terrible crime my man he said looking at him sternly let this be a warning to you not to take vengeance into your own hands forgive me sir muttered james vane i was deceived a chance word i heard in that damned den set me on the wrong track you had better go home and put that pistol away or you may get into trouble said dorian turning on his heel and going slowly down the street james vane stood on the pavement in horror he was trembling from head to foot after a little while a black shadow that had been creeping along the dripping wall moved out into the light and came close to him with stealthy footsteps he felt a hand laid on his arm and looked round with a start it was one of the women who had been drinking at the bar why didn't you kill him she hissed out putting a haggard face quite close to his i knew you were following him when you rushed out from dailies you fool you should have killed him he has lots of money and he's as bad as bad he is not the man i am looking for he answered and i want no man's money i want a man's life the man whose life i want must be nearly forty now this one is little more than a boy thank god i have not got his blood upon my hands the woman gave a bitter laugh little more than a boy she sneered why man it's not an eighteen years since prince charming made me what i am you lie cried james vane she raised her hand up to heaven before god i am telling the truth she cried before god strike me dumb if it ain't so he is the worst one that comes here they say he has sold himself to the devil for a pretty face it's nigh on eighteen years since i met him he hasn't changed much since then i have though she added with a sickly leer you swear this i swear it came in hoarse echo from her flat mouth but don't give me away to him she whined i am afraid of him let me have some money for my night's lodging he broke from her with an oath and rushed to the corner of the street but dorian gray had disappeared when he looked back the woman had vanished also End of chapter 16